Hi, this is your host, Sapin Bhartia, and welcome to another episode of TFR Let's Talk. And today we have with us Steve Manuel, co founder and CEO of Dilipso. Steve, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, for having me on. Uh, since it's the first time you and I are talking in front of camera, I would love to know a bit about uh, the, the story of the company. Uh, and also, we will talk about you know, how you are seeing the whole evolution of WebAssembly because we are talking a lot about that. But let's start with you know, the company. Yeah, we're a very new startup. Uh, launched the company officially in August of 2022. Um, we are a, still a small team for engineers working on bringing uh, more maturity and better dev tools to the whole WebAssembly ecosystem. And we're taking um, kind of an agnostic approach to where are you running WebAssembly? It could be in a browser, it could be in a serverless environment, it could be on an IoT device or embedded inside of another program. Um, we kind of see WebAssembly through this lens of a bunch of different users, a bunch of different places WASM can run and want to make sure that we're um, you're building tools that acknowledge those use cases across the board. What role do you think WebAssembly is going to play in the modern cloud-centric world? Even you'll see a lot of tweets where somebody say, hey, WebAssembly is even going to replace Kubernetes and you know all those things. So I want to understand the role <laughs> WebAssembly is realistically playing in this world. I mean, there's a bunch of different advantages that WebAssembly provides to you compared to you know a more Kubernetes-centric uh, workload like a container. Um, mostly in the sense of the size of the unit of deployment. WebAssembly binaries are, you know, an order of magnitude or more smaller in many cases than a container is. Um, and that allows you to pack more compute or functionality into the same amount of resources that you might use, you know, for a, a, a pod running containers in Kubernetes. Um, it's not always the right uh, architecture. You have to make sure you're actually, you know, solving the job at hand. Um, but uh, there is a, a really interesting future for WebAssembly in the cloud that brings costs down, that brings uh, operational simplicity, uh, and provides developers, I think, with a, um, a better experience overall uh, when it contrast with a complex system like Kubernetes if you don't need all the functionality that Kubernetes is providing you. What kind of solutions are you offering to the WebAssembly ecosystem? We started the company with an open source project called Xtism. Um, you can find our site at xdism.org or on GitHub at slash xdism slash xdism. And xdism is a project that provides a very simple path for developers of uh, a number of different languages. So you can write your program in any one of the 16 languages that we support and use our libraries for your language to embed a WebAssembly runtime and execute WASM code and call the functions inside that WASM code without having to deal with all of the pointer uh, magic and tracking offsets and sizes of moving data from in your program natively into the WebAssembly runtime and then in reverse. So for example, if I wanted to call a function that was compiled from Rust in my Python program, uh, Xtism makes it particularly easy to load a library in Python, call that WebAssembly function that was compiled from Rust, and give it some complex data, maybe like a big string or a JSON blob, and then get that same kind of complex data back out. It's classically known that WebAssembly can be difficult for some developers to use when they get beyond the famous add example. Most, most tutorials with WebAssembly use an add function because it's easy to demonstrate. You know, I can give two integers in and get an integer out. And um, you know, that's convenient because WebAssembly's primitive types are limited to 32 and 64-bit integers and floats. Um, and so when you want to start to use more complex data, um, it becomes a challenge for some developers. And Xism makes it really easy for developers to uh, get beyond that hurdle. Um, we recently announced a product, which is the first of kind of a suite of observability and security and monitoring uh, and, and analysis tools that we'll release for WebAssembly users, uh, this product is called ModSurfer. And ModSurfer acts as a system of record for all of your WebAssembly code. If you want to track you know, modules that are being used inside of your infrastructure or that you as a developer are compiling and want to get some insights into. What are all the imports and exports, the function signatures of the module, um, help me to de debug code, uh, and then also a validation tool that lets you ensure that your WebAssembly code isn't doing anything or has any functions in it that you don't expect it to. Um, so from a security perspective, uh, ModSurfer 
Mods Ripper provides teams with some uh, you know, pretty compelling functionality that hasn't been available before. And if I'm not wrong, uh, Mod Surfer is an open source project, is that correct? Mod Surfer is partially open source. Yeah, we provide the command line app, um, which is open source on GitHub. You can find that at github.com slash dilibso slash Mod Surfer. And that pairs with our closed sourced system of record. The application you can download for free though from uh, dilibso.com. And for developers using it locally on their machine, it's completely free. Um, and then if you want to upgrade and use an enterprise version of this that can be deployed inside your own infrastructure to put into a pipeline or to track you know, a real-time production system, you can come to us and, and get a license to do that. And we're happy to help you get started. I was looking, you know, you folks do have a lot of open source projects that folks can find on GitHub. Talk a bit about why open source, what value does open source bring to new companies like Dilipso? Open source is super important for us. I mean, we use a lot of open source and, uh, you know, we have benefited from, you know, folks in the past building incredible software that they've open sourced. So in a sense, it's a, you know, participation in the community and giving back to you know, other developers as well. On the other hand, you know, a lot of our tooling um, is very sensitive to kind of the lower level uh, code integrations that teams may be working with. And from a security standpoint, being able to see the source code that is being tightly integrated into the rest of your application um, is important just for visibility and making sure that you understand what that code is doing. Um, it also gives a small company like us, you know, a platform to distribute software in a very efficient way. Uh, there are no sales involved. There is no, you know, uh, there's no one trying to take orders or anything like that. It's just a repo on the internet that developers can hopefully get excited about and check out and use uh, as it makes sense for them. If you look at the Wasm Cloud or whole web, web assembly, uh, it is kind of not that crowded, but there are a lot of vendors, there are a lot of companies, there are a lot of, a lot of projects there. Talk a bit about the role you see for Dilipso there. Uh, uh, what value are you bringing or what, you know, some of the key problems that you're seeing and you're like, hey, this is what we are solving in a unique way. Yeah, there are a bunch of companies doing really cool things in WebAssembly right now. And I think this is a pattern, you know, that uh, we constantly see emerge over time as technology has this cyclical nature to it, where a new idea comes into play. Uh, people get very excited about it, want to experiment in a way or launch a company um, to solve a problem or to bring new products to market. And um, a lot of the companies in the WebAssembly space are taking a stance that is very specific to a particular use case. You know, you see cloud companies building serverless platforms, or you see frameworks coming out for a browser application, um, you know, making it easier for developers to build browser applications. And um, alternatively, we're taking a stance that says, we want to build tooling that is useful for developers in all of these different verticals. So independent of whether you're writing code that's going to run in the cloud or writing code that's going to run in a browser, uh, Dilibso's tooling should help you accomplish your goal independent of where your code runs. And WebAssembly is fairly unique in that sense that it is portable across a bunch of different environments. Uh, and because it's the same architecture across those environments, the same tooling will work in all of those environments as well. And that's very exciting to us. Well, you know, Mars Rover is relatively new, but Actism was released last year as an open source project. And can you talk about what kind of adoption, what kind of use cases are you seeing of these two projects and products? Well, Actism, first and foremost, uh, is being adopted on, on GitHub uh, quite regularly. We're seeing projects like server proxies or browser applications who want to provide their users with the ability to extend the functionality of their project. You know, so for example, uh, there's a really cool proxy, uh, an open source project by uh, a team called Maith in France, uh, the project called Otoroshi. And it is a server proxy um, that has embedded a our, our Xism runtime uh, to allow for plugins to be injected into the proxy path. So if a request comes into the proxy and you wanna change something about that request, or as the proxy sends that request onto a backend, uh, a plugin can alter you know, the path of execution or enhance that request in some in some regard, which is a really good use case for a plugin system. Uh, and then ModSurfer we're seeing used all over the place where people want to validate the WebAssembly module itself. So we have a GitHub action that can be used for free. Um, and the GitHub action looks for a WebAssembly module in your repo. 
you know, a compiled module, as well as a check file, which is a YAML file that basically describes some expectations of that code. So once you've compiled your source code to WASM, Monster for Validation Tooling can take over and say, hey, you expected this code to use um, these functions, but it also has this, this function embedded in it, or you expected not to use WASI, and this module expects WASI to be available. So it can check for some inconsistencies between the truth of the module and the expectation of its potential run, runtime environment. Earlier, we were talking about the role WebAssembly is playing in the modern cloud. Uh, then we talked about the ecosystem, which is growing. And now we are also seeing the adoption of these projects also growing. Uh, where do you see uh, WebAssembly is heading when we look at, because of course, it's very hard to predict and also with open source project adoption depends on, you don't even know who is using it, it's all on GitHub. But what, what kind of pattern you're seeing uh, for the further evolution of WebAssembly? I think that we'll see a lot of very interesting usage where it WebAssembly spans multiple different environments, right? So like right now we're thinking about, you know, all cloud or all browser or all edge. And WebAssembly provides this, you know, <clears throat> consistent interface, a consistent architecture, so that depending on the compute at hand, some of that code can be distributed across the cloud. Some of the code can be on the edge. Some of the code can be on the browser, but it's all compiled in the same format. So instead of having to wrangle together JavaScript code for the browser, all the frameworks and dependencies that are required there, you know, uh, Docker containers for the cloud, and stitch together all this complex architecture, you could potentially have one unit of compute as WebAssembly, and it distributes across a plethora of different targets, uh, cloud, edge, browser, IoT, et cetera. So I think that'll be an interesting outcome for WebAssembly, and um, I don't think we're terribly far away from seeing that come to light. Now, when we're talking about the WebAssembly, I would also like to uh, hear a bit about you know what what are the things that you are planning you know uh, for the company that you know the projects you're working on, products you're working on, the problem that you are looking at solving uh, for future. Yeah, I mean, look, we see a lot of really interesting growth in WebAssembly. We're excited about the pace of innovation. Um, we, again, like I mentioned, are focused on kind of bringing tools that are agnostic to a bunch of different use cases or runtime environments. And one of the things that we you know, felt was missing um, and are excited to contribute to um, are some kind of generic observability tools to give more insight into what's actually happening in your WebAssembly code as it's executing or offline to determine you know, what's the performance characteristics or various instrumentation details about my WebAssembly code. Again, independent of its targeting the browser or IoT or serverless or the cloud, wherever it may be, bringing some kind of consistent view into what's happening inside WebAssembly code, um, I think is something that has been missing and we're excited to be working on some you know, interesting work there. Steve, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about, of course, WebAssembly and Dalipso. I would love to have you back on the show again, but I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Talk to you again soon.